Hello, I'm Tim Smith of the Adams County Historical Society and welcome to another episode of Monuments Monday. And today, I think we'll talk a little bit about the monument for the 5th Main Battery, one of the artillery units at the Battle of Gettysburg that was assigned to the Artillery Brigade of the 1st Army Corps. Uh, the 5th Main Battery's monument was dedicated on October 3rd, 1889. And this actually was dedicated with a bunch of other monuments on uh, Main Day. I think there might have been 16 different regimental monuments that were placed and dedicated on that day. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania Day on the battlefield was September 11th, 1889. So, you know, the uh, uh, late summer, early uh, fall of, um, uh, you know, 1889 was a busy time for monumentation at Gettysburg. Um, and, you know, a lot of dignitaries from the state of Maine came out during this um, Maine at Gettysburg ceremony. And there actually is a book that was generated from these proceedings called Maine at Gettysburg that was printed in 1898. Now, according to the Gettysburg compiler, um, the party contained many distinguished sons of Maine, among, among whom we noticed the Honorable Hannibal Hamlin, ex-governor, ex-senator of the state, and ex-vice president, who was here with Mr. Lincoln at Gettysburg on November 19th, 1863, and last visited this place on October 29th, 1864. So according to the Gettysburg paper, uh, Hannibal Hamlin visited Gettysburg at least three times. And according to this article, he was 81 when he visited here at Main Day. Now, I am not aware that the vice president attended the ceremony surrounding the Gettysburg Address. So that's interesting that they say that, but I don't know if we can find another source for that. But uh, one thing I'd like to mention, uh, if you want to want to win a good trivia uh, contest with your friends, remember that Abraham Lincoln's vice president, Hannibal Hamlin, during his first term from Maine. Now, I want to mention the site that we're at today, uh, where the 5th Maine Batteries Monument is placed, is uh, called Stevens Knoll. Now, when the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association first purchased this land, it was called McKnight's Hill because it's part of James McKnight's property. And I'll show an 1898 photograph of his house, and you can kind of see between the house and the bar and back towards where we're standing at the fifth main monument. This ground was actually one of the first pieces of land purchased by the GBMA when they were uh, gathering together the land that would become the Gettysburg National Military Park eventually. Now, um, it's called Stevens Knoll because at, eventually they name it that because it was uh, Greenleaf T. Stevens that was the captain of the 5th Main Battery at uh, Gettysburg. And um, uh, we have some information about this mining being brought out here. And this is uh, the Gettysburg uh, compiler of August 27th, 1889. The Hollowell Granite Company last week erected the Stevens Battery Monument at Culp's Hill. So it was erected by the Holloway Granite Company, um, you know, another one of those companies that was contracted to put up monuments on the Gettysburg Battlefield. So it's put up in August, and as we mentioned, it was dedicated in early um, October, along with other monuments from the state of Maine around the battlefield. Um, and the 5th Maine Battery fought in 
the first day's fighting west of town on July 1st. And there is a marker for the afternoon action that they were involved in at the Lutheran Theological Seminary. And uh, in next week's Monuments Monday, we're going to highlight that marker and tell a story about that. But uh, after the First Corps is driven back through town, they rallied on Cemetery Hill. And here on July 2nd, uh, and July 3rd, this uh, battery of six Napoleons was placed. And on the second day of the battle, they were engaged in heavy fighting uh, as the Louisiana Tigers and North Carolina Tar Heels of Hayes and Avery's, Avery's Brigade came out of the edge of the town and swung across the fields attacking East Cemetery Hill behind the camera. And the battery suffered heavy casualties uh, in the battle at, on the first day's fighting at this site. And we have a list of casualties here from the Portland uh, Daily Press on July 21st, um, 1863, I'll show. And you might notice highlighted on this list is John F. Chase of Augusta, who was, uh, according to this, had his right arm amputated. Now, a little bit about John F. Chase. Um, he was born in Chelsea, uh, Maine, in uh, 1843. And uh, uh, he was the son of Oliver and Rachel Chase. Uh, he originally enlisted in Company B, 3rd Maine Infantry, but was discharged for disability in June of 1861. Uh, in 1860, late 1861, he joined the 5th Maine Battery. Um, in 1862, he was uh, sick in the hospital for some time uh, with typhoid. Um, he returned to his unit uh, at the Battle of Chancellorsville. This unit saw heavy action, and John F. Chase would be awarded the Congressional Medal of, his, of Honor for his actions there. And, of course, on July July 1st, he was involved in the fighting west of the town, and on July 2nd, while the 5th Maine Battery was engaged in an artillery duel against Confederate artillery out on Benner's Hill, um, he was wounded. And uh, there are several accounts of his wounding and some of them are conflicting and some of them are inaccurate. But I'm gonna read you this one from 1886 just because it's one of the more dramatic uh, versions of it. It was the third day of the fight. It's actually the second day. And the battery was posted on Seminary or Weeds Hill. No, Seminary Ridge is on the other side of town. Weeds Hill is a term for Little Round Top, nowhere near here. The rebel General Pickett was making his famous charge on our left center, and a terrible artillery duel was in progress. This has nothing to do with Pickett. The battery was in a hard place, being between crossfires. The air was full of the missiles of death. The heroic Chase, with his shirt sleeves rolled up and his face black with powder and smoke, was in the act of ramming home a cartridge when a rebel shell fell about three feet from him and burst. The fragments flew in all directions. Chase was thrown nearly a rod from his gun and fell insensible. His clothes were literally stripped from his body. His right arm was blown off, his left eye torn from its socket, while his breast and shoulders were gashed with wounds. He was carried to the rear. Two days afterwards, when the dead were buried, he was being conveyed with others to the grave. A groan from him attracted attention when he was discovered to still be alive. Upon recovering consciousness, the first words that came from his lips were, did we win the battle? Now, according to various accounts of this, 
and I have actually been to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and I have pulled his pension record and looked it over. There are a ton of accounts. And first, I should mention that it was on the second day he was wounded, and apparently, as he was loading a shell into one of the cannons, uh, it prematurely exploded. So it was a shell that he was holding that blew his arm off and wounded him. And according to the doctor's uh, analysis of it, he was hit 48 times with shrapnel, and he lost his eye and his arm was ripped off. So he had a glass eye the rest of his life. Now, the rest of the story, um, then he was removed in an unconscious condition to a hospital. After a week, uh, there was some hopeful signs that he might recover. But the surgeon said there was no hope for him, that he could not live but another day or two. He was carried out of the hospital and put in a tent alone to die. It was supposed um, that it would ha occur in a few days. Um, and then, a few days later, according to the account, the, uh, um, one of the surgical assistants came in and said, hey, you know, that guy's still alive out there. So they brought him in, they worked on him, and he actually survived. Um, according to one of the accounts that's very dramatic, he was said to say, when I regained consciousness, I was in a wagon with a lot of dead comrades being carted to the trenches to be buried. I moaned and called the attention to the driver who came to my assistance, pulling me up from amongst the dead and gave me a drink of water. Can you imagine being in the bottom of a cart with dead that were taking to the being taken to the trenches when you woke up. Now, I should tell you that the hospital that he was taken to was the Leitner Farmhouse, which is down the Baltimore Pike. And today, that's a bed and breakfast. You could stay at the place where John F. Chase uh, recovered. Um, but he did recover. He was actually at White Church Cemetery on the Baltimore Pike for uh, a while, and um, eventually sent back to his home in Maine. Um, after the war, he took a great interest in veterans affairs, and he became one of the uh, leading uh, uh, members of the uh, Fifth Maine uh, uh, Regimental uh, Association. And he was here at the dedication ceremony of this monument. Now, he ended up dying um, in 1914 in St. Petersburg, Florida. He had moved to Florida in uh, 1896. But um, one of the most interesting things about him is that he became a tour guide at the New York Cyclorama. So the Battle of Gettysburg Cyclorama painting, there were several versions of it, and he actually gave a lecture at the painting while it was in New York. And about the time of the 25th anniversary in 1888, he moved to Gettysburg, and there's an article in our local newspaper about him um, trying to get a tent placed on Cemetery Hill where he was going to have the Gettysburg cyclorama on display, at least the New York version of it. Now, you may know that it was in 1912, 1913, that the Boston Gettysburg cyclorama actually came to Gettysburg on Cemetery Hill. But uh, put here up on the screen, we have a number of business cards that Chase uh, used over the years. And one of them actually has his address as Gettysburg, the city hotel. So he lived here in town for a while. 
Um, and then, of course, one of the more uh, interesting things about this is we have a couple really nice photographs um, of him here, uh, taken the day after the dedication ceremony. Oh, but before I tell you that, let me just mention that Chase was somewhat of an inventor. And in 1888, there's a lot of um, discussion about a flying machine that he has invented. So he is years ahead of the Wright brothers uh, in this article we'll post. So there are two photographs that we have recorded by Gettysburg's William Tipton, battlefield photographer. And according to the catalog, Tipton's catalog, these two photographs were recorded on uh, October 4th, uh, 1889. So the day after the monument dedication, and you can see in the caption, uh, these are listed as Chase and other survivors of the 5th Main Battery. Um, theoretically, Greenleaf Stevens is another one of the people in this image. But um, uh, Chase is standing right here next to the monument. You can kind of see uh, his empty sleeve. Um, but if you look back across behind him, you can see the Baltimore Turnpike in the historic photograph. And on top of the hill, perhaps you can see the uh, Gettysburg Prospect Tower. Uh, the tower that was taken down, removed in the 1890s when uh, General Hancock's equestrian statue was placed at that location. So one view is right here and the other view is looking back in the other direction towards where the cannons were placed in front of this battery. I want to point out that when you look at the photographs, you can see the negative number. And of course, we have uh, William Tipton's 1894 catalog, and you can look up those numbers and find the caption for them, as well as the date that these photographs were recorded. Now, um, uh, before we go any further, let me just say that we only have a catalog uh, catalog that goes up to 1894, and it only lists photographs by the negative numbers with famous people or battlefield veterans in them. So stop sending me emails to a 1920s photograph with a negative number scratched in and ask me the names of the people in the photograph because we don't have any such records. <laughs> we get that a lot. But we do have this early catalog, and we can determine some of the dates of these early photographs through their negative numbers. And I should mention, these two photographs we just showed, um, uh, they are both at the Clement Library and the William Tipton Collection there in the University of Michigan. And they're both in, uh, come from um, uh, the main state archives, which uh, you can download these photographs on the internet uh, from uh, their site. It's either the main state archives or the main state library. Excuse me if I uh, get the wrong one. Um, remember, if you like the content we've been putting up on our YouTube page, please like and subscribe to our channel.